You're listening to Policy Currents, a weekly podcast from RAND. I'm Deanna Lee. And I'm Evan Banks. Every Friday, we bring you new insights from RAND's latest research and commentary. It's January 26th. The United States has pushed for Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu to commit to a Palestinian state once the Israel-Hamas war ends. Last week, he publicly said no. According to Rand's Raphael Cohen, one key reason for this is that, in Netanyahu's view, Israel's 2005 withdrawal from Gaza gave Hamas a sanctuary to plan, train for, and ultimately launch its October 7th attack. Netanyahu believes that moving toward a two-state solution now would only make this problem worse and increase the risk of another attack. This view is vastly different than how the U.S. sees things. In the American narrative, the context of October 7th is the failure of the Israeli-Palestinian peace process in the 1990s. After these negotiations broke down, Israel pursued a strategy of killing militants without simultaneously providing Palestinians with real political or economic opportunities, a strategy that was bound to fail. Peace, therefore, begins by providing those opportunities to Palestinians and charting a path to a two-state solution. It's important to note, however, that opposition to a Palestinian state stretches well beyond Netanyahu's office. Support for a two-state solution among average Israelis has been declining for a decade. According to a Pew Research Center survey conducted several months before the Hamas attack, just 35% of Israelis thought two states could coexist peacefully. Further, there are significant practical challenges including demarcating airspace rights and water, not to mention relocating the 700,000 Israeli settlers in the West Bank. This leaves the U.S. with few levers to pull. The best path forward may be to start small, Cohen says. American pressure might help convince Netanyahu that planning for the war's end and rebuilding Gaza can help guarantee Israel's security. Quote, done right, reconstruction could foster the mutual trust necessary for a more lasting political settlement. Can artificial intelligence, more specifically large language models or LLMs, the technology behind AI chatbots, be used to launch a large-scale biological attack? A new RAND study explores this question through a red team exercise. Teams of experts role-playing as malicious non-state actors were assigned realistic scenarios and tasked with planning a hypothetical biological attack. Some teams had access to the internet, while others had access to the internet and an LLM. The results show that while existing LLMs can generate troubling content associated with a biological weapons attack, often mirroring information readily available online, they're not capable of helping to facilitate or plan such an attack. This suggests that today's LLMs do not increase the operational risk of a biological attack by a non-state actor. However, the authors note that ongoing research is important. Quote, just because today's LLMs aren't able to close the knowledge gap needed to facilitate biological weapons attack planning doesn't preclude the possibility that they may be able to in the future, said Christopher Mutan, lead author of the study. This is worth continuing to study because AI technology is available to everyone, including dangerous non-state actors, and it's advancing faster than governments can keep pace. Many U.S. veterans struggle every day with mental health conditions such as PTSD and depression. Psychedelics, including MDMA-assisted therapy, may be a promising treatment that could help. Rand's Rajiv Ramchand, who joined us on the podcast last month, recently testified before a House of Representatives subcommittee on this topic. He discussed what it would take to conduct more research and gather more evidence on the effectiveness of psychedelic treatments. Here's Ramchand. There currently are good treatments available for conditions like PTSD, but they do not work for everyone. 
there is a need to invest in research to develop new treatments. This includes adequate funding for the National Institutes of Health and research programs within VA and DOD. Federal investment is necessary because private funding for novel therapies for mental health conditions is waning. Congress can also make the process for conducting research on psychedelic compounds more efficient, relaxing the notoriously time-consuming, confusing, and expensive processes required to conduct research on Scheduled One drugs would expedite research into psychedelic-assisted therapy and help get novel treatments to veterans more quickly. Ramchand also discussed the importance of addressing barriers that could prevent veterans from accessing these treatments if and when they become available. The first is cost. MDMA-assisted therapy will not be cheap, especially in the early years. This could lead veterans who can't afford MDMA-assisted therapy to try and access it in illegal markets where a dose is cheaper, but could include dangerous adulterants like methamphetamine. Another issue is whether the Department of Veterans Affairs has the workforce and resources to provide MDMA-assisted therapies. VA would need to determine how to provide this time and labor-intensive treatment and who will provide it while also meeting expectations to provide care to veterans in a timely manner. The final issue is quality. Once a treatment protocol is approved by the FDA, if VA providers are to deliver it, then the VA must decide how to monitor adherence to that protocol. Sticking with veterans, a recent RAND study provides a comprehensive look at the financial, physical, and mental well-being of nearly 300,000 veterans who are single parents. Here's a brief rundown of the findings. Veteran single parents are more likely to be women and less likely to be white than veteran coupled parents. Unsurprisingly, they also face greater financial insecurity than veteran coupled parents. Median personal income of veteran single parents was $42,000, compared with $62,000 for veteran coupled parents. As a result, veteran single parents are also more likely than veteran coupled parents to experience food insecurity and less likely than veteran coupled parents to own a home. Many veteran single parents a higher percentage, in fact, than coupled parents, report using benefits from the GI Bill to pursue higher education, with black and Hispanic single mothers reporting the highest rates of school enrollment across all veteran single parents. However, those enrolled in higher education also report significant barriers to using their GI Bill benefits and achieving academic success. What can be done to help ensure these parents have an opportunity to thrive? Our researchers have a few recommendations. To start, transition services should target veteran single parents as a unique group. These individuals might need more guidance on career paths that allow them to balance family and career, affordable child care options, and information about how to apply for SNAP food assistance and other benefits as they transition out of the service. Second, provide support for single parents in higher education. We found that a relatively high percentage of the most financially insecure families headed by veteran single parents were enrolled in higher education. But key components of the GI Bill make completing a degree difficult for veteran single parents. Adjusting in-person requirements, waiving withdrawal penalties, and increasing the affordability of part-time degree participation could help single parents benefit from higher education as much as veteran coupled parents and veterans without children do. Third, provide federal financial support for child care for veterans. Interestingly, there is a program that helps lower-earning VA employees with child care but no similar program that specifically helps veterans who are parents to young children. That's it for this week's episode. If you'd like to learn more about what we discussed today, check out the show notes at rand.org slash podcast. We'll see you next week. RAND is a nonprofit institution that helps improve policy and decision-making through research and analysis.